uh, today's topic is on mosques in America. This is the uh, fourth day of Islam Awareness Week, and our topic today is on mosques in America and how they are facilitators of democracy. Uh, our guest speaker for today is uh, Dr. Uh, Karam Dana. He is an associate at the Center for Political American Studies and Committee of Social Studies at Harvard University. Previously, he was a uh, faculty member at Tufts University's uh, Fletcher School of Law, and uh, he was a co-principal investigator at the Muslim American Public Opinion Survey program from 2006 to 2008. I would now ask you all to give him a warm round of applause. It's pretty cool. Uh, I, on, the, on the flyer, I was introduced as the renowned Harvard scholar. Uh, I did not choose that word yet. Uh, that's very nice of you. Thank you very much. I love the flyer, though. So, it's a good one. so um, thank you all for being here today and, and for the invitation, first of all. First of all, it means a lot for me to come back to my alma mater, University of Washington. And I'm pleased to say that I actually, as of two hours or so ago, I've just accepted a, a tenure track position at the University of Washington, Boston. So today's talk, um, we'll be specifically talking about mosques in America, but I will actually put that in a larger context, uh, looking at um, the relationship between Muslims in the United States um, and how non-Muslims look at Muslims in the United States. And where does that come from, um, positive or negative sort of attitudes? But um, I will zone in and describe what mosques are in the United States and um, why have they actually become, over the past few years, an important issue um, of contention in the United States. Um, specifically, that mosques and Islamic community centers around the United States have uh, been represented as breeding grounds for terrorist activities in the United States. Um, and it has become increasingly, of course, relevant to policymakers, uh, scholars, and public at large in general. Um, and we noticed that there has been a lot of um, uh, representation that at times is, is misrepresentation in fact, of what Muslims are in the United States and why they actually live in the United States. Um, and, and there's a questioning of whether or not Muslims can in fact be good citizens in this country. So, so uh, with that, I'm gonna um, give you something to just bring back some memories of a few years uh, ago. In 2007, there were two people who came to uh, Seattle, rode one of the ferries, which most tourists do, um, and they were looking at the signs of the ship. And uh, they were walking around and uh, mesmerized by its size. Okay? One of the people that worked on the ferry took a photograph, and it was a national issue. It became an issue whereby there were two Middle Eastern looking men sizing up the ship and they were about to blow it up. Turned out that those two people were in fact originally from the Middle East. We actually don't know where they're originally from, uh, but it turned out that they were French citizens who had come to the United States um, and they, they were so uh, interested by how wonderful the ferry system is. Um, anyway, so uh, it became a national um, hot button issue immediately. And everyone was talking about it, and Fox News, I recall, was, you know, talking about, you know, if Seattle is next, what's the next target, etc. right? Um, interestingly enough, in a newspaper like the Seattle Times here, you notice that the framing of the argument, the FBI, and I'm quoting from this article, as you can see, hopes to determine whether the men are innocent, on the one hand, or, my words, innocent passengers, or possible terrorists. There is nothing in between. And that really represents the uh, situation in which Muslims have lived in the United States in the years after 9 11. Now, uh, the perceptions of Arabs and Muslims living in the United States after 9 11, of course, one would expect that it would change, and it changed dramatically. But the interesting thing is that um, um, the, the change was 
was um, problematic in the sense that it, it targeted uh, individuals, community centers, um, uh, an entire community of a religious community in the United States. Um, this, of course, has taken place in the United States in the past. Um, Jews, for example, have faced various sorts of discriminations in the United States. Um, you've got Catholic, uh, uh, German Catholics, Irish Catholics, Italian Catholic, Catholics facing similar sort of challenges. But for this to happen in the 21st century, um, many people were in fact quite shocked by that. Um, now, let us look at the broader issue and provide some context to Islam in the West um, to, to kind of have a, kind of a starting point to discussing mosques and what they actually do in the context of American politics. Okay? So, <clears throat> there is something uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, is uh, there's a, a, a hypothesis of uh, something called the clash of civilizations by a scholar um, named uh, 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 Samuel Huntington. And Samuel Huntington, in fact, was, uh, he came up with this, with this hypothesis soon after uh, the collapse of uh, the Berlin Wall and kind of the collapse, the subsequent collapse of, of the Soviet Union, um, he came up with this statement of the clash of civilizations, and there was a question, in which he described the world as one that is based on, uh, no longer based on ideological differences, but rather ones that are based on cultural difference, cultural fault lines is what he called them. And then eventually, there's going to be a clash between different cultures and the battle, the important battle, is going to be one between Western civilization and the Islamic civilization. Now, um, interestingly enough, when he started conceptualizing this, he had the clash of civilizations with a question. Then that created a lot of attention. And three years later, when he wrote the book, guess what? The question mark was that. So that kind of tells you how people, uh, you know, how, how, how the, some scholars have thrived on bashing of some sort, and putting that sort of a paradigm that there is a clash of some sort. So I would argue that it's centralized, it's sent, 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 you know, uh, there's that sensation that is attached to the concept of talking about, uh, about Islam in the Western context. Um, another scholar that I'd like to mention here is a scholar named Bernard Lewis from Princeton University. It turned out that Bernard Lewis in 1919 was the first person to ever use the term clash of civilization an article published in the in Atlantic Monthly uh, entitled The Root of, of Muslim Rage, in which he described that um, the uh, Muslim world, so-called Muslim world, which uh, many of you kind of understand that there isn't really one thing per se called the Muslim world. All Muslim, there's that great diversity within Islam that we cannot necessarily kind of put everyone in one particular category. But anyway, so uh, for the sake of time, Bernard Lewis described that um, um, that the clash of civilization that, that uh, Muslims, young Muslims, are coming coming to Western societies and they're angry because of their own societies and the way they are treated, etc. And they have those ideas that are ingrained in them that are going to become problematic in Western contexts. So um, it's quite interesting that a few years later, some other scholar from an entirely different discipline picks it up and starts writing uh, about it. But taken together, the view whereby there is a clash of civilization, and ironically, the more we put the world in terms of um, th this versus that, or us versus them, it becomes unfortunately a self-fulfilling prophecy. But the more we talk about a clash taking place, as opposed to building bridges between two civilizations and two cultures, the more we actually contribute, it seems, uh, to that particular problem. But, um, I'm just going to give you a quick quote from Bernard Lewis to tell you um, how he feels about Muslims living in the context of um, in the context in, in, in Western society. How do Muslims view living in Western society? He says, "What is truly evil and unacceptable is the domination of infidels over true believers. For misbelievers to rule over true believers is blasphemous and unnatural." since it leads to the corruption of religion and morality in society, and to the flouting of even an even abrogation of God's law. So this is how Bernard Lewis was looking at that particular um, uh, sort of how do Muslims
live in Western societies and how do they view living in Western societies. And that, in my opinion, is problematic because it's a very slight, um, very, very specific um, interpretation of what Islam is and how Muslims view non-Muslims or living in non-Muslim context per se. There has been so many different arguments, however, um, philosophical in nature, legal in nature, and whatnot, um, that would describe that there is a compatibility between the teachings of Islam in general and living in a Western context. Okay? That, however, has become quite, um, uh, quite marginalized, unfortunately, I must say, um, over the years. And this view of the world of that Samuel Huntington and Bernard Lewis have actually occupied the public imagination, unfortunately. So um, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about um, how Muslims have actually been studied in general in the United States. Um, unfortunately, we know very little about Muslims in the United States. Um, and it has to do with the fact that they are kind of the late arrivals, more or less, in the context of the US. That does not mean, however, that there has been no Muslims from the beginning, quote unquote, uh, in the American story. Um, there is a very famous story of, uh, of a, uh, an African slave um, named, uh, named uh, um, Ibn Suri, who came to the United States against his wishes. And in fact, he was a prince. And he has been, uh, is the, he came to the United States against, of course, his wishes. But uh, the interesting thing is that he was sold into slavery. And he became quite influential in the public sphere in the 18th century. So you do have some um, people who have actually contributed, who are Muslim, who have contributed to the American story. First. Two, you've got another uh, person from the Northeast, for example. His name is Alexander Russell Webb, who served as the first ambassador, U.S. ambassador to the Philippines, who converted to Islam and who had never actually, he, he had never met a Muslim in his life, served as an ambassador, believing that he's a Muslim, and wrote, in fact, the first book on Islam in America. He says, Muslims in America. And there were very few people who, had lived, who, who were Muslim who had lived in the United States. So Muslims have actually been part of the American story. We somehow choose to not talk about them, given the fact that their numbers are rather small first. And two, they have, uh, most of Muslims who, who live in the United States today have come as immigrants later in life uh, to, to, to the United States for various reasons. Uh, but particularly uh, for education, um, for reasons that are more or less not different than any other minority groups in the US. Um, so um, another point of contention when we want to study Muslims in the United States is that the U.S. Census does not collect data on religion. So in Canada, for example, you do find the census in Canada asking about a person's religion, but not in the United States for obvious reasons, because they want to keep that idea of separation between state and, uh, state and religion intact. So um, you don't necessarily know how many Muslims live. Estimates, however, go from 2.1 million people living across the United States to around 12 million. So really, that's kind of a pretty bad range. It's like, OK, from 2.1 to 12 million. You know, that's really not scientific, to put it mildly, right? Um, for various reasons, I would say. Because some people who are Muslim have last names like Anderson and Johnson. Because you could actually become a Muslim without, um, uh, you know, with, by just simply, you know, declaring the shahada. <coughs> so it's basically you say a couple of phrases more or less, and you become a Muslim, and you, you accept that, and, and you proceed with your life more or less. So it's really hard to pinpoint who is a Muslim more or less. Okay. So there's that element one. Two, um, Islam is not necessarily associated with a particular race, as we all know, okay, or a particular ethnicity or a particular language. Of course, with the exception of Arabic, more or less, because the Quran, the Muslim, the Muslim, is a book that is written in Arabic. That doesn't mean, however, that only Arabs can, can be Muslim. More or less. Um, so that provides a greater sense of diversity, more or less, within, 
within Islam. Or, or less the, the acceptance of non of, of different sort of racial and ethnic groups and linguistic linguistical groups uh, within within the idea of Islam. Um, so it becomes rather hard to kind of pinpoint where more, more, more or less Muslims live, quote unquote. Um, and I was asked that question in the past, where do Muslims live? That's a great question. <laughs> um, who wants to know? <laughs> uh, so, so you do find those occasional questions that, if anything, they, they reflect more or less the ignorance about what Islam is. Okay? And the very basic um, knowledge about Islam. I wouldn't want to call it ignorance in the negative sense, but it's just simply that it's the absence of information or accurate information. And the more you have Samuel Huntington's clash of civilization paradigm, kind of like putting everybody's um, kind of imagination about what Islam is, it becomes kind of a, a bigger problem. So um, that aside, uh, I want to show you something quite interesting here. Um, <clears throat> This is a graph. Ta-da. We're in this building, I guess, so graphs are common daily occurrences. Uh, I'm not sure, is it clear? Yeah. OK. So this is a count of how many articles have been, um, have been published in US, US mainstream media outlets um, about Muslims or Islam and terrorism, the word terrorism and Islam or Muslim within one word difference between the two words. So they have to be right next to each other, right? It's a very simple Lexis-Nexis. For some weird reason, I thought that there's something happened at some point that made the negative um, representation of Islam and Muslims exponentially grow. And I realized that it's a trend. Like, we hear a lot more about it. So I decided to do this. Um, again, it's more or less not necessarily scientific because we don't know the particular context, but to bring it in the public sphere, to bring it into, into, into the public uh, media world, right? To start looking at, at that, one can only, one can only um, notice here that Muslims um, and terrorism are somehow connected to each other, especially in the recent so it didn't happen in 04 as much as it did in 010 or 2010. Um, and the real reason we really more or less don't know, but maybe one of the incidents, the one like in Seattle that some people thought that these two guys um, that I showed earlier um, are either terrorists or, or innocent passengers. You know, something to that effect has actually contributed to this dialogue, contributed to this uh, public conversation uh, or anti-Muslim conversation. So one question that continues, uh, or one, one issue that continues to appear in public media is whether or not mosques are breeding grounds for terrorists. Where do Muslims live? We don't know. Well, where do they hang out? OK, the mosque. And you kind of like, <laughs> when, I, when I say that, I always like, oh my god, you know. I'm sure every mosque has a bunch of cameras around it, but you know. Um, but aside from that, um, I'm not sure if that is accurate or not. I just put that out there. Um, but it, it's quite interesting that it becomes the place. It becomes the place of the battle, right? It becomes the battleground of ideas. Um, that that here the mosque is where Muslims hang out. So there must be something that's going on in here, and it must be somehow connected to terrorism because. Thank God we have Samuel Huntington and Bernard Lewis to tell us how, what Islam is and how they actually view Western civilization. <laughs> so um, that said, it becomes kind of important to study mosques as space, right? And whether or not actually going to the mosque contributes to one's uh, isolation from American politics or actually integration, or, or I would use different sort of words, to make somebody more active in the idea of American participation or democracy. Okay. So, um, interestingly enough, um, even, even if there had been a lot of studies that describe mosques as institutions that are quite similar to all other religious institutions, right? Uh, places of worship, like uh, particularly black churches, for example, 
they have contributed to allowing those who participate, who, who actually uh, uh, go to black churches, to become more active in politics, right? Uh, similarly with old churches, but specifically black churches in, 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 in what the role that they played in the civil rights movement. Then when we think about synagogues, they actually also uh, provide that sort of sense of community and kind of organized level of political participation that exists within that level, within that community of, of worshipers who go to that particular religious institution. Um, that perception, however, is not, does not include mosques, per se. Okay? And in a recent book that was published by, um, by Bob Putnam, the famous Bob Putnam, for those who know who this guy is, um, Bob Putnam looked at religion uh, around the United States um, and how people think of other religions. So Muslims, how do they think about Christians? How do Christians think about Muslims? How do Catholics think about Protestant Christians, etc., etc.? And then he found <coughs> that um, Muslims and Buddhists tend to be the least liked religions in America. Isn't that interesting? Sure, I can, for, for you know, whatever, I understand the reasons as to why Muslims can be seen as a threat, or more not necessarily liked, let's put it that way. Okay? But why Buddhists? Any answer? Yeah? No, uh, good guess, very sophisticated one, but no. Sir? They don't have churches that make them like us? Uh, I, good, that's a great, a great, but see, like us. Really, I, would, I want to like say Christians, that. For we Jewish just Christians. don't know much about Buddhists. It's the idea that we just don't know much, which brings me back to the idea of ignorance, not in the negative sense, but rather the absence of, of accurate knowledge. Right? So, so Muslims and Buddhists are, are unfavorable communities, religious communities in America. And the explanation has simply to do with that. Um, and it was quite interesting when I, when I heard Bob Putnam say this, I was like, wow. And then for him to actually rely on, on a very qualitative argument as opposed to the numbers, it's surprising, that was quite um, Sorry? Uh, the book is called American Grace, and it was published in 2010. Um, America, so it's recent. So uh, the way they did it, they had a panel study, is what it's called. So they went to people and asked them, public opinion sort of survey, and they asked them over a three, three about, uh, no, what is it? three times they asked them over multiple years. So they asked them in 2005, 2007, 2009. The same people, by the way. Of course, not all of the responses. That's, that's really why, um, why it's a very significant contribution to the study of religion and politics in the US. Um, anyway, so it's called American Grace. So, um, another reason why we should study mosques, I guess, is because um, uh, Congressman Peter King in uh, last year uh, said that uh, mosques are breeding grounds for terrorists and there are places where radicalization takes place. So, um, uh, and it is a very powerful congressman uh, and uh, he would allocate a whole lot of money for Homeland Security. And even though a lot of people said and then wanted to argue against what, what, he, what he was, uh, against the arguments that he was making. Um, he kept saying, and I quote, over 80% of mosques in this country are controlled by radical imams. Certainly from what I've seen and dealings I've had, that number seems to be accurate. Um, I must say that my numbers are quite different than his, uh, because I will be showing you a lot of them very soon. Um, another, in the larger context, um, you always hear the issue of Barack Hussein Obama being brought to the forefront of debate. So, uh, if the middle name of our president is not important to study Muslims in America, um, it, I think, you know, then it becomes kind of a partisan issue, and, and American politics is highly uh, politicized, I guess, and we always talk about elections and so on. So that question of his, whether he's a secret Muslim or not, uh, whether or not he, um, you know, he practices five rakahs a night, you know, before he goes to sleep, you know, or not, that becomes a very important part of the debate. Um, in addition to various sorts of anti-Muslim rallyings that have taken place in the United States, um, 
for example, here in Melinda, California, um, about uh, two years ago, there was an incident whereby the local Muslim community wanted to collect money for a local shelter, not for Muslims to actually use the services of a shelter, but for battered women in the neighborhood, in the, in the, in the area. Um, then you, all of a sudden you have public officials rallying outside and saying, you know what, this is terrible. We're going to have to, you know, eradicate the Islamic threat from America. So it becomes sort of an important question to address. Now that I have convinced you that it's important to study Muslims in America, I would like to proceed by, um, by saying, um, where do we get data on Muslims? Um, one data set um, that was conducted in 2005 by Amani Jamal, a professor at Princeton, who by the way works with Bernard Lewis, but she tells me that every time she sees him, turns around and runs in the opposite direction. Um, uh, she studied mosques in New York City, and she published the first article on the topic. Um, Amani Jamal is a great scholar, and uh, she proved that those who attend mosques, uh, <coughs> mosques are more inclined to participate in American politics. They are more civically active. They're more engaged in their own community. They're more engaged in American politics. Um, uh, but it was a very small, city-specific, a lot of people were talking about whether or not that element of New York is playing a factor that's kind of a cosmopolitan area, more or less. So um, uh, I, along with a colleague from here, from the University of Washington, Matt Barreto, decided to embark on a big, big project. We did not actually know that it's going to become a big project. We just started with uh, very simple uh, sort of surveys around the United States. We ended up with something that was introduced earlier, the Muslim American Public Opinion Survey. It cost, about, cost us, don't share this. <laughs> it cost us less than $20,000. <laughs> less than $20,000. And then we uh, ended up uh, the largest survey of Muslims in the United States. And that was, we didn't know. Someone told us that it was the largest. We have a sample size of 1,410, collected in 22 different locations from around the United States, 12 different metropolitan areas. And we just wanted to know what Peter King wanted to know. Are mosques really places that breed terrorists? Do Muslims really think that there is an incompatibility between Islam and, and, and the American way of life? Do they like apple pie? You know, those sorts of things. <laughs> and baseball, I guess. Baseball and apple pie. They're kind of the measures of integration. So, so we wanted to ask those questions, and we just asked them. Like, as a Muslim living, as a Muslim living in the United States, do you think that the teachings of Islam, in fact, um, you know, are compatible with the American political system or not? You know, that sort of question. Um, in addition to a wide battery of questions that I'll be more than happy to, to address. And, um, and it was quite interesting that um, you know, we, we, we measured participation. Um, and some of the key questions that we analyzed are listed here. but. Excluding Salah and Jum'ah. Jum'ah is Friday prayer. Uh, salah is prayer, regular five times a day. So aside from that, how involved are you in the activities of the mosque? And then another question, do you think Islamic centers and mosques help Muslims integrate into your society or keep them more isolated? That's another measure that we have. How much do you think we have in common, or you, uh, the person who's, who's uh, taking the survey, do you have in common with other Muslims in the United States? So to find more or less that element of, of sense of community. Do Muslims feel that they are connected to other Muslims? Among us? Okay. And then um, is Islam, actually the phrasing here is a little, just for the sake of space, but um, it was, uh, are the teachings of Islam compatible with the American political system? Do you believe um, that the, the following is true? And then we looked at the political participation from, we created an index for those who do some sort of um, analyses. Um, political participation from zero to four. Community meeting, rally or protest, writing a letter to public official or campaign, donating money to a particular campaign or, or, or an official. So that is a measure in US politics of, yes sir. So you, you weren't concerned with differentiating between political participation in, in Muslim issues and, and non-Muslim issues? 
um, but that's a good question, and we kind of followed through with that. But what we wanted to know is whether or not um, they were contributing to the Amer overall American stuff. So we were not asking about the community itself. Um, uh, but we, we made a distinction that, that is easily defined. The paper has not been published on that, but great idea, thank you. Let's <laughs> talk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so the Muslim American Public Opinion Survey fielded in December 2006 through 2008. But the interesting thing about this is that it was different in terms of the way we collected it. How so? We went to eighth grade. Um, the Eid is that celebration that takes place right after Ramadan, and, and uh, they're there too. So they're more like Christmas, I guess. Well, more or less, for the lack of a better term. So there are two important events in, in, in Islam. Um, one after Ramadan to celebrate the end of fasting, and then one that takes place during the, uh, uh, the pilgrimage, um, to celebrate the pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, so the interesting thing about those events is that you find person who is religious, prays five times a day, fasts all the time, etc., kind of more or less upholds the, the, the code of being a Muslim, right? You find them going to that event, but in addition to that, you find someone who is not necessarily a pretty good, quote unquote, Muslim, okay? So you find someone who doesn't necessarily pray all the time, maybe sometimes, maybe they don't, but they do identify as Muslim, they do identify as such. So you find people going to those events to, to say, you know, to, to, to say hello to their aunts, to give the you know, season's greetings, more or less, to their, their aunt's neighbor, more or less. So it's not uncommon to find someone who's had an alcoholic beverage, which is not an acceptable act in Islam, to actually go to those events, yet they do identify themselves as Muslims. So that provided us, in terms of its survey, with that variety of level of religiosity that one would look for when you're looking at that wide variation within Islam, <clears throat> within, within a sample. So, um, and it was quite interesting that we were able to collect that data set because um, it turned out that those who are involved in mosque-related activities tend to participate higher than others. <coughs> so just one quick um, graph to show you. But then, it turned out that the more people go to the mosque, the more they decide that their primary identity is one that is Muslim rather than national origin. I happen to be a Palestinian American, right? According to this logic, I would stop calling myself Palestinian American but rather call myself Muslim American. So the more you go to the mosque, the more you become an inter part of a community, more or less, in the United States. Okay? And the more you would lose, not necessarily lose, but rather kind of identify primarily with the idea that you are a Muslim in America. Okay? Now, why is that important? Because um, we tend to find that, um, you know, that great diversity of Muslims the great diversity of where they come from, national origin, ethnicity, race, etc., and language, of course, we find that to be um, kind of a missing puzzle of the story. You know? Would somebody be identified as, as an Arab or a Muslim, or at times they're conflated concepts together, right? So to actually understand the dynamic that mosques play, <coughs> the important dynamic that mosques play in creating that common identity of Muslim, becomes quite critical. So um, this is another result. Um, do you think that Islamic teachings are compatible with participation in the American political system and sorted by the degree of religiosity? And I, I must say here that the degree of religiosity is a little different than just simply mosque, uh, than, than being, the participation in mosque with their activities, but it's part of it. Um, it, it been part of the question is, how much do you think you actually follow the Quran and the Hadith in your daily life? That's part of it. Religiosity and how how much do you uphold that? But anyway, so so the same thing applies to uh, mosque um, participation, and you notice that um, the higher degree of religiosity or mosque uh, related activity or participation in mosque related activities, okay, the higher it is, the higher uh, percentage of those who believe that there is a great deal of 
compatibility between the American political system and the teaching of Islam. And that's a critical finding because it actually stands against um, quite a lot of talk, let's put it that way, a lot of scholarship and literature on how mosques participate in Western context, specifically when we are talking about someone like Bernard Lewis and someone like Samuel Huntington Orban, to the two arguments come, come on, come back together. Um, so, um, so when we talk about predictive probabilities here, we're saying that you know, the more people participate in mosques, and I'm looking at this one all the way up the graph here, um, more political science jargon, so none of you will probably like it, well, aside from that. Uh, so you notice that those who are very much involved in mosque-related activities, okay, um, there is a 64% predictive probability that they are going to report that there is a great deal in common between being a Muslim and living in the United States. I mean, a great uh, in common with other Muslims in the United States. So that, if anything, means that the more you go to the mosque, the more you create that sense of community. Okay? The more people go away from that national origin category or self-identifying uh, self uh, identity. And then going into the context of um, into, into thinking of themselves as primarily Muslim. One. Two, um, there is that predictive probability, the next graph at the bottom, showing that mosques do in fact play a role in making Muslims integrate more into U.S. society, as you can see there, okay? So, uh, one last thing I want to talk about mosques is that there has been a great deal of talk you hear on the news between Muslims who are Sunni and Muslims <coughs> who are Shia in, in different contexts, international, international level. How does that play in the context of the United States? Um, so, I love this graph. It's like, you know, when you have the aha moment, 3 a.m. moment, it's like, wow, this is a great graph. So, the degree of mosque involvement, the more that goes up, the more you, you, you participate in mosque-related activities, okay, the more you, um, you uh, participate in American politics, as those graphs show. But Shias tend to actually participate more in American, form of, in American politics. Uh, they're more civic participation, a lot more than Sunnis from the get-go, if they don't go to the mosque at all. And that has to do with, with simply the fact that there's, there are certain things within uh, the, the Shia tradition of following a particular manager. A manager is a reference. So there's that idea of there's more organization in that sense. So, um, so there's that sense of activities in relation to, to different things. So it has something to do with that particular tradition. Okay? So, uh, but what's interesting here is that the more Shias go to the mosque, and the more Sunnis go to the mosque, okay, their own respective mosque, or an integrated sort of mosque uh, that, that have both traditions and other traditions, okay? the more you notice that the gap between them in terms of American political participation, that gap starts going away. If anything, that shows that mosques actually play a role not only in American politics per se, but also to create the, the Muslim living in America regardless of your particular tradition. So maybe, maybe, there are differences between Sunnis and Shia outside and so on. When it gets to American politics, mosques play a very critical role in actually bringing them together and, uh, and overall increasing the trend of participating in American politics. So, yes? Uh, just, it's interesting to me to understand uh, why the people or the argument is the people who don't go to the mosque, non political uh, their argument about that Islam, Islamic life or being a Muslim is uh, incompatible with the life in the U.S. Do you think that this argument because they don't know Islam or they don't have like not about Islam? People who do not go to the mosque, you mean? Yeah. So the opposite of that. Actually, we don't know. So what I was able, I mean, let me let me describe my methodology here. If I may. I know. I'm really <laughs> Besides, I'm a renowned Harvard scholar. Remember <laughs> that, that poster of yours? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I was 
able to do here is, is actually imagine a dark room, right? So what I did with a flashlight is I looked at a particular thing and I described it. I do not know the other side. So I don't know whether or not those who do not go to the mosque at all, because I went, again, to eighth grade, people who self-identify as Muslim. What about people who say, you know what, I don't want to even be a Muslim. I don't even consider myself as such. I have not been able to survey them or ask them questions. I use the word survey as question here, not survey. 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 <laughs> so, um, so we don't know. Why do they say that? I think, I think it has something to do with community building, in a sense. So um, I asked Putnam, who was like, you know, he wrote up, again, Putnam, the guy I was talking about. Um, I said once, you know, what do you think happens in churches? And he wrote a book once called Bowling Alone. That Bowling Alone is a bad idea. Bowling with other people is a great idea because it makes you more to participate better in American democracy. So he says, you know, bowling alone is bad, right? Bowling with others is wonderful. Bowling with others from church is amazing. You know? so, so there's something that, you know, that, that takes place within the context of religious institutions that people become very close. Um, it's not necessarily, I mean, it's not per se a club. But there's, there's that element of, um, uh, I, I wouldn't want to call it magic. You know, once you set foot in a mosque or a church or a synagogue, that all of a sudden, like, oh, I feel like donating $5,000 <laughs> to, to a public campaign. You're not going to do that. But rather, you feel that you, you, know, that, that you, you are inclined more. I think it has to do with the socialization process of how you communicate with other people, how you build relationships from one, from one person to another. Um, and how you actually come together as a community to address issues of concern. So um, I do not know what people who I would not serve in more or less would say, uh, but I think it has to do with uh, their way of thinking about, uh, about America in, in a different way. Um, in, in kind of a, there are different concepts uh, or descriptions of um, immigration in America. So there's something called assimilation, there's something called acculturation, there's something called incorporation, something called integration, and I'm sure I'm missing three more. And the four that I've just described, they're all very different concepts. Acculturation means I adapt to certain things. Assimilation means I lose some part of my identity to adapt, but not necessarily adapt, but rather I kind of lose an important critical part of my identity to fit more or less. Um, integration is to, to be able to, to live more or less in the, uh, in the you know, salad bowl analogy of how America cosmopolitan you know, in America is. Which, you know, the salad bowl versus the melting pot, melting pot, all different ingredients coming together, versus the, the, the idea of one's own individual identity as part of a larger country. So, so I think that it's, it has to do with how they actually view themselves in, in, in that sense, and how they, which approach they have. I'm not sure if that's a satisfactory answer, but no, it's way. Glad to hear this. Well, um, I live for that. <laughs> that was a great answer, thank you. So, um, so again, there's that sense that uh, people, Muslims who go to the mosque, become more, more, quote unquote, identifying with other Muslims as one particular identity. And then overall, that contributes to them being uh, more active in American former politics. And with that, I will stop my talk. I guess we're going to do Q and A. Oh, um, should I do it? Ahsan, Mr. Nadim, great. So I have a question. You you started off with the talk uh, about talking about uh, the Peter King trial, mm -hmm. and I remember last year there was a lot of buzz about it because it was you know, political season. Um, people were getting pretty riled up with the Los Angeles trial as well, mm -hmm. um, but that kind of went away. So I was curious, like, what did you actually find out? There were, there were not trials, there were actually what is it called hearings, is what he called. Uh, he did a couple of, he did one more on, uh, man, he did something I didn't have data for. Because when he did that mosque stuff, there was Peter King, who has been a congressman for, what, 38 years? Um, and, and he says, you know, he didn't have data. And I was brought in, like, in, in kind of like the media circus, as someone with data. Like, he was a congressman way before I was even born. 
So it's like, okay, it's me. They found me. That, that tells you the problem. Um, I mean, I'm glad, first of all, but I think it's, no, it tells you that this is absent from the American intellectual discourse, right? Um, what did he find? Nothing. He just had a little circus, I think. Um, and he continues to do that. The second time he did, he did the hearings, he did it on um, Muslim radicalization in prisons. But now Muslims are infiltrating American prisons. <laughs> that, that, like, what a terrible way of doing it. <laughs> like, if I were thinking about going in, to any sort of a prison, it's not going to be an American prison. <laughs> any other prison, but not the American prison. But anyway, aside from that. So, so they're infiltrating American prisons. And I think it has to do with the social network, right? Of like, there's a criminal. Now that <coughs> is Muslim, <laughs> and they're coming out, you know. <laughs> but it's, so that's that's the problem. Anyway, so what what came out of it? Nothing. I think it only contributes to creating um, more isolation for the community, for the Muslim American community, and putting them in that particular, in a very difficult position. In my um, how is that going to proceed? That is not going to stop anytime soon. And believe it or not, the Hussein from Hussein Obama is going to come back very soon. Of course, with gay marriage. But, you know, it's funny, it's like how picking and choosing certain things become problematic. And partisan politics played a very critical role in that. But nothing happened. Just bad, bad breath. Sir? Uh, I wanted to ask about the, the process uh, of mosques becoming uh, normalized or, or being viewed as uh, similar to churches and, and temples. I wanted to ask you about your analogy to African American churches uh, during the Civil Rights Movement. It's my impression that, that one of the reasons why those churches were able to be sites of civil resistance and peaceful resistance and not seen as radical or sites of radicalization is because there was a very clear black nationalist movement that existed separately from those churches. That's a brilliant line. I think that that's, that's correct, yeah. But that, that doesn't exist in this case. Yeah, well, um, I, think, I think it depends. There's a historical context that we're talking about. I mean, we're talking about 2001, <coughs> post-2001 world, um, 21st century. Um, I think if this happened in the 60s, uh, Muslims would have been in concentration camps like, like it had happened previously. Well, not the 60s, I would say 50s, let's just say that. But the 1960s set a stage of a particular civil rights uh, kind of world, more or less, that, that civil rights are important, and, and the radical movement is kind of seen as disassociated from it, more or less. Um, I, mean, I, I personally think that, that the fact that Martin Luther King was part of civil rights, but was very critical of his message, um, which a lot of Muslims hold the same message, but unfortunately they're not heard. So I think that also contributes to something there. Um, but I mean, I think part of your question was, was why is it not taking place in the case of, of mosques? Is that correct me if I'm wrong? Well, I mean, I, I have an idea why it's not. Tell I guess me, the question me, is more, more well, no, right. it, it just, it's, it's more what, what's a strategy? What's a, a way of dealing with it? Because one thing that you know, senators can do or congressmen can do is say, oh, well, there is a radical you know, movement of, of violence and that is coming from mosques. And how do you, how do you defeat that? No, I think the more you defeat it, is the more, more we study mosques from different levels. I mean, I, I, this is a, a quantitative sort of a study yeah. that matches uh, involvement in mosque-related activities and how that more or less maps or predicts our understanding of more or less are those people going to participate in American politics, more or less. Because that's eventually what we like in American politics, that for people to vote, for people to be more simply engaged, right? With a uh, difference of opinion, great, but, you know. Uh, so, so more or less, does that take place? I did. Now, uh, I did just one little part. There are ways to study the mosque and what happens when somebody walks into the mosque, ethnographic sort of work, for example. I think that would enable us to provide answers that we have not been able to, to gather, more or less. Um, so that's, that's one thing. So, so I think there, there is plenty of research to be done there. I think geographers need to study this as well. Okay. I think, uh, uh, and also like someone to actually study the history of mosques in America. Why this town and not that town? That tells us a story. Um, uh, I don't have a clear answer to you because of the limitations of, of what I've done. It's, it's only natural. Thank you for the question. Sir. Yeah, what has become of the Dearborn, Michigan mosque? Is 
has there, um, I mean, I haven't been researching on, on it lately, but has there been, is there still resistance uh, by the community to, um, to build the mosque? Yeah. Well, it's not only in Dearborn, but that happened all over, right? Yeah. Um, so um, the, the most pressing case was the one in, in the south. I don't recall exactly where it was, but I think it was in, what was it? Tennessee? Yes, yes, Murfreesboro. <coughs> in, 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 in Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. So the interesting thing is that that was a highly politicized case, and the arguments in court were based on the idea that Islam is not even a religion, that it's a cult. And they brought somebody who's, I think, an electrical engineer from the town, that it's gonna be a problem. No, no, actually, no, no, the street planner of the town. They brought the street planners because it will create congestions if it's built right here, right? And he's like, well, sure, yeah, you know. And then, then, <laughs> then they asked him, like, do you think Islam is a religion or a cult? And he said, I'm not authorized to answer it. But do you really think? So I think there's that element of politicizing. <laughs> you know, so, so to ask someone, a street planner, over this is, is problematic. Now, have they, those, I, I believe, will continue to be a problem, in addition to the question of, Sharia coming to America, Islamic law, that we have to pass a law against something that doesn't exist. Okay? Um, and I keep referring to like gay marriage, for example, like, when states decide to say like entirely, we're not gonna, I think it's even more rational not to say I agree or I disagree, aside from that. But one would imagine that, you know, that why would states do something like that? But one cannot imagine the reasons as to why um, why would they say, we, just in case something will ever, ever happen like that, we're going to say no to it now. Which is like, it's kind of ridiculous if you think about it. Um, so Sharia law plus the mosques in, in, in the state. So that, that, that is a problem. Not only in Dearborn, but it continues to be, there's about seven different sites, I think, last time I checked, about the number. So seven different sites that are, you know, there's a confrontation around building mosques. Not, not in Washington State, so we're still safe. <laughs> I don't know, did I answer your question? Again, you know, oh, yeah, that, that, yeah, it's, it's like it's a specific case, sure, Dearborn, Michigan, uh, Murphy's Bar in Tennessee, other places, but, but then that becomes kind of a part of a larger, I mean, the Part 51 uh, mosque controversy, for example, right? I mean, yeah, I saw that's, 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 that's the one, but not yeah, Dearborn, Michigan, yeah. But yeah. there was a problem in, in, in Michigan as well, over, over mosques as well. Yeah, but it's, I don't think it's in Dearborn. I think it's 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 out. It's it's kind of not not close to Dearborn at all. Anyway, I'll say that. Cares about Michigan? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Michigan is a great state. Um, sorry, sir. Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, one. Well, just I need to hear your comment about this point because uh, I believe that uh, the mosque and the building is not very important, but which is important is the brain and the and the, the opinion of the people who are. Uh, like the key leader in, in medicine, we'll say the key leader opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the key leader opinion in, in this mosque, like the imam and the others. I believe from I believe that um, that there should be a based Islamic community in the U.S. People who are very well educated, who could supervise these mosques or at least the mosque in the town, to make sure that the best brains are in this mosque. Mm -hmm. Because I tell you an example in my country. <coughs> In Egypt, when you go, to, I, I know you know Egypt very well. No, no, no. Okay, so in Egypt, when you go, you will find that the uneducated people who are the uneducated people who are resisting the building of churches, while ten percent Egyptians are Christian. Yep. While the religious people, the educated people, who are they are getting into this problem and trying to solve it and try to tell the others who are uneducated that Islam didn't say or didn't try to oppress other religions. Yes. Islam doesn't oppress others. It's about religion of, of so, so, so it's important from your point of view. Do you think that, that the, the mosque and the building is important or the brain and the, the, the No, of course, you're, you're, you're right, you're absolutely right. I mean, like, uh, a mosque is more about what you, what you, uh, you know, the sort of people you engage with, the more uh, the type of people you, you talk to, right, and so on. Uh, and, and I think it has to do with that human capacity, the human resource, I guess. Uh, Pretty bad term, human resources of mosque. Yeah. Um, uh, but but you're right. You're right. 
I mean, it's, it's not the building itself, but I think its location matters, more or less. Um, uh, in terms of, is it in a town, is it not? There's, there's, there's geographers do this sort of stuff. I think it would be important to study that. But, but you're right, I think the more the core of the issue has to do with the people who are inside of mosques, who go and frequent the mosques. I think that if you have an intellectual just going and, and, and just hanging out with other people um, twice a week or three times a week to talk about, you know, whatever, after they do the prayer, right? That, in my opinion, enriches people uh, more than uh, a, a massive, beautiful, awesome mosque like the ones you find in Dubai. Like I mentioned, every beneficial event or every thing that improves the Muslims and improves the people, this is the to be a mosque. That's not a sure, mosque sure, by the okay. building, but because we are working saying that that's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, what I, that's, that's, that's the point. Yes, you're right. You're right. I, think, I think you're absolutely right. But I want to add one thing. You know, when I was doing this study, this study, Muslim American public research, we had some serious backlash. I was, um, some people said that I was working for the FBI. <laughs> Some people said that I worked for Fox News. Which are more interesting. One lady approached me once in some community event here in Seattle while I was a graduate student. She approached me and she said, Are you Karam Dana? I said, Yes. And then she goes, like, Are you doing this stuff on Muslims? I said, Yes, I And she said, You know what? You are creating division within Muslims. And I was like, Well, it's just a scientific survey. And then she said, You ask on your survey. You know whether people, whether Muslims are, are you Sunni or Shia or whatnot. So I gave that, but not only that, I actually put it as option, because I understand the sensitivities of the question. I mean, people would prefer to say, I'm just Muslim, right? We all, we would all say that, right? And I understand that. So I left it as optional, but I really need to, I need that graph. See, that graph, <laughs> well, I needed a graph like this. So we'll it together because I had that question. But the interesting thing is, is, is this. She said, there has never been a problem. Or any, there, was, there has been, never been a division between Sunnis and Shias, and you are creating it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, I mean, with all due respect, lady, you know, I think that division happened about a thousand years ago, and I'm sure it had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so, so that sort of stuff matters. So people are sensitive. There's that anti. You know, so, so how many Muslims in this room, I'm not going to identify you, <laughs> but uh, how many people always feel that you always have to defend yourself? You always have to defend that um, you know, you're a Muslim. Oh, so do you guys like eat babies? You know, more. You have to defend yourself with sort of answers. It's like it's ridiculous. You know? um, and, and I think that's part of the problem is that there is that sense of we do not know much about Islam. Um, and 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 we ask, you know, there are some ridiculous questions that are being asked at times. Um, so there's that anti sort of. People feel isolated, and when people are isolated, they become very defensive. Um, my my, my co-author, my colleague, uh, Matt Ferretto, who's here at the University of Washington, uh, once when he was collecting data, um, he, I was teaching, so I wasn't there. So he goes to, to a local mosque, not going to say where it is, uh, to like collect some data. And then an older gentleman comes to him and he says, who are you? I said, he said, I'm not, you know, we're collecting data. He's like, have you talked to a Muslim before you wrote the question? He's like, yes, uh, you know. Kind of not me. Um, uh, you know, we were working on this together, and we want to, you know, we want to understand the Muslim American community better, and blah blah. Um, so he comes. He says, "No, you work for the FBI." <laughs> uh, you know, he's like, "No, we don't." I said, "I told you, I work with a, with a Muslim American guy." He says, "What is his name?" My friend. He's like, "You know what? I'm not going to tell you his name." He's like, "Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> I told you so. <laughs> of course, you work for the FBI." He goes inside. He's invited to give the sermon for that group because an older gentleman. So he comes up on the on the podium and says, uh, "Brothers and sisters," tells everyone this older gentleman. He says, "I want to tell you that there are FBI agents outside <laughs> trying to get your opinions over everything. So please do not fill out the sermon." <laughs> so then, then like I finish teaching like 50 minutes I teach, and there's like seven calls from that. <laughs> My, my co-author, who's like, oh my god, this guy, man, like, he came out of nowhere. You know? <laughs> because it's true in the sense that people are very skeptical. Yet at the same time, I, I, my wife who is here in the audience, by the way, so she lives here in Seattle, and I've been, I've been living for the past three years between Seattle and Boston. And the crazy part of this is that I travel a lot, and uh, sometimes I get bumped up to first class. Yay. <laughs> Once I sit, there's this lady sitting next to me, 
And she said, oh, where is, are you going home? I said, well, it's kind of weird, because home is here and there. You know, I fly between two places. And my wife lives in Seattle, and I work in Boston, and et cetera. And then, uh, and then she says, oh, you know, what do you do? And you know, I said, this is, I do Middle East politics, and I do Muslims in America. She said, oh, interesting. Are you yourself a Muslim? I said, yeah, I am. She said, you know what's crazy? Is that people who seem articulate like yourself. You know what's scary is that you could, in fact, could have already put a bomb on this plane. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't tell, you don't say the word bomb with an Arab or Muslim or anything good at all on an airplane, especially on first class. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's a, this is where we have a problem, is that people are not willing to actually engage in a kind of a very simple debate over this. Um, so, and, and to actually, to just say like, look, just simply being Muslim or an Arab or whatever it is does not mean terrorism. Doesn't mean you know, etc. Um, and it's a problem. Maybe. Um, so, so is that that uh, that lack of knowledge on the side of non-Muslims in the United States about Muslims? One, and then two, you have that um, the Muslim suspicion of every question being asked, very legitimately on both sides. And that's where we have a problem. That's why we have to start building bridges and kind of, and, and you, know, you have to be able to answer every question, you know, every possible question. Even when some of them are really ridiculous. It's like, you know, do you really, really, really think that Islam is not, does not tell you that violence is good? You know, I mean, that sort of question. So it's like, yeah, I do, actually. Yeah, because I've read the Quran possibly 22 times, and you haven't, you know? Um, I've done research on Islam, and you haven't. So, yeah. I, I, with the thought, with, I have a more or less a learned opinion of all this. And the answer is yes. And, and see, the thing is that, you know, sure, I possibly happen to be from the Middle East originally, but the interesting thing is that people who are, from, or are not from the Middle East originally, who have studied this sort of, this sort of phenomena, also agree. Okay. So, so I think all of those voices are important in a larger discussion of who, you know, who's what and what not. You know, I mean, it's, it, it needs to be kind of, you need to, to kind of understand a little details. Yes, sir? Uh, I, I apologize. I feel like I'm dominating the Yes, you are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just really curious. You were talking about Shia and Sunni mixing. How much mixing is there along uh, ethnicity or country of origin? If, if there's a bunch of Indonesian immigrants and Muslim immigrants, do they go you know, that's great. Mosque often, that's, that's an amazing question. Because every time we would do something, um, we would, uh, I mean, again, what, what we're, remember, most of the stuff that we got was from Eid prayers. And that includes everyone. Um, so I would break them down to different sort of ethnicities uh, to see whether or not there is something there, whether it's primarily um, uh, Arab, primarily Syrians, primarily Pakistani, etc. So I would look into that. Um, they all are very, very kind of, uh, very diverse, with the exception of one. And that was in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And it was 100% Shia. And that was quite interesting. Um, it's, it's just because there are a lot of Shia. Sorry? Yeah, in that particular, in that particular event. But they did, I mean, what I did was I did another one simultaneously in a different location you know, so to gather more. Sort of like, all right, so people from Oklahoma are Shia. Great. You know, um, a different form of. Iran is in Oklahoma, great. <laughs> that's what I started studying. So that's why it has to kind of get deeper into it to kind of figure out the details. Um, uh, yes, Miss. Um, I had a question about um, one of the graphs you had. Sure. If you want to go back to the graph. I'll go back to the graph. Uh, so the one that you showed where um, the number of anti Muslim articles has risen. Um, yep. Um, so I'm sorry, I came a little bit late, but even after. Uh, uh, they, uh, that was a puzzle. Oh, yeah. The puzzle is we don't know. But uh, we know that it was, uh, was covered by some incidents. I mean, why did it take six years or so, or actually seven years or so, to start connecting Islam with terrorism within one word difference within every argument? I mean, that's ridiculous, you know? Um, I, I don't know. But it tells you something. But you know, I mean, I, I notice it. I mean, sometimes you don't notice it. Like, well, you know, I feel that maybe because I read a whole lot of articles about this, that's probably why I feel that there's a lot about it. No, there was. This is it. I, 
I, I don't have an explanation. So, why don't you... I'll just uh, respond to that. Oh. Would you say it's because it was election year? And it was because of Obama... Right? That's a great, great answer. It was just more... It was all Obama I think that's a, great, that's a great theory. Yeah. We need to explore that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good article for the day. Isn't it? That's great. I think that's what... Yeah, that's, that's a pretty plausible argument. We need to do the research to actually back it up, to kind of know the details of that. Yeah. Sir? Uh, how did you talk of incorporating more factors other than religion and uh, uh, the, the other world religions and the other world factors on the line access stuff? Uh, for participation? Yeah, for participation. Well, the index of participation from zero. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, how did you talk of like, uh, academic background or the, of course, yes. the time of that person living in the United States? I mean, I feel like All of that is terrorist purpose, so that's how it's constant. Meaning that I've taken into account gender, I've taken into account, um, I've taken into account uh, socioeconomic, SES, socioeconomic status, so education, income, etc. So that is all taken. So these were um, yes. Now there is a slight uh, interesting part that with the question of do you think as a Muslim in the United States, do you think that Muslims that the, the, the teachings of Islam and the American political system are compatible? Women, Muslim women tend to say no more often than that. And do you think, I, I don't know, do you know the answer? I mean, I have a hypothesis, but, which has to do with the fact that women actually are more visible in the public sphere. Okay. Women who are Muslim tend to be more visible, partly because of the hijab and so on. Um, um, <coughs> well, I guess primarily because of the hijab, sorry, not partly, but rather primarily. Um, and, and, and that is more, that makes them more visible. So they are more in the public sphere I mean, I did hear of a story that a metro bus driver here in Seattle, what is it, six years ago or five years ago? Have you heard of, anyone heard about this? That there was a woman, a Muslim woman, who got into the, onto the bus and he shut the door on her hijab and part of and her hair. And he said, could you please stop? And he said, maybe you shouldn't wear that. But yeah, it didn't create the brouhaha that they should, but yeah. And, and, um, and that was about six years ago, I think, yeah. It's, it's, it's messed up. So, so women tend to say, no, you know, there, is there a compatible? No, of course not, because they are actually more in the public sphere. And they deal with this a lot more than men. Because, like, you know, most Muslim men, more or less, they could be a, you know, a white-looking guy, you know, an Italian dude, you know, or, <laughs> or an Irish, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, so, yes, sir. Yeah, just also another important point that I, I, I also need to be implemented about it that the responsibility of the Muslim in the American community also, even to help themselves. I'll tell you an example. The, for example, there is an argument between Muslims about uh, covering the face, like uh, the niqab, covering the, this argument. Even in the Islamic country, in, the in my country, they always say that uh, people cover their face from, it's a habit from thousands of years, because this area is like the sun in Tennessee, or the sun rays in Tennessee, very high, and the people and the Bedouins who live in the desert try to cover oh. their face. And even if you go in Egypt to the desert or in, in Palestine, you are my neighbor, you know that. You'll find some Christians from the Bedouins. They sure, doing that. Yes, exactly. They are not Muslims. Yeah, well, originally, the concept of the hijab was, in fact, you know, something yeah. that came from Christianity. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you know mm -hmm. it's, it's mothers wear a particular form of veil. Is that what it's called? I don't know. I'm not happy. Yeah. But when you try to apply the same concept even in a community in the U.S., like most of the Americans are Westerners, mm -hmm. and try to uh, to do the same habit or to be very like uh, to, to show that you are very religious by doing something that uh, something that Muslims even uh, are doing about it. So do you think that always also increase the, the uh, like uh, you know, the isolation? The, yeah, the isolation and resistance, and even they try to uh, in the American community maybe they'll try to to hate all the forms or all the versions of these kinds of Muslims. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you're wearing the cover of hijab, I'll put you in the same rank. In the same, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, you, you, like France. Yeah, yeah, but see, that, I'm glad, yeah, that I, I was going in that direction, the France direction. Um, there's a guy who finished his PhD from the University of Washington, a guy named Ahmed Kuru. Ahmed Kuru is from Turkey, and he's in San Diego now. Great scholar, wonderful man. We were colleagues here. Wrote a book on how states look at secularism. Okay. So it looks at Turkey, looks at the United States, looks at France, looks at England, uh, a couple of other countries in the mix. Okay. But the interesting thing is that he found that there is, the, when, when states, the state, the apparatus, state apparatus, approaches 
the, con the question of religion and, secular uh, and secularism. Uh, the United States is more, um, it's more uh, passive. In France, on the other hand, there's more active in the sense that we want to ban, we want to be very, very uh, active in, in banning all forms of religion, for example. So I think there's that element of, that allows for, in the, given the fact that the U.S. is a special case in that, in that sense, um, which she argues that Turkey should be like the United States, but they're more, um, more on the lines of, of uh, France, that's, that they actually are active in banning the hijab. So, uh, given the fact that the U.S. is a very specific circumstance, in a sense, and that, that provides the, the culture of accepting whatever you wear, you can wear whatever you want, more or less, um, that becomes an issue. That becomes kind of like that. There is that element of, of, uh, of people wearing whatever they want to wear in the public sphere. And it becomes conflicting, in a sense, between different ideas and whatnot. Now, does there need to be a debate? Absolutely. There are people in the Muslim American community who, um, who, you know, disagree violently with me for what I say. What I, say. Um, I mean, just the very simple fact that I asked Muslims whether or not they, um, you know, are you Sunni or Muslim or Shia, etc., and, and that created kind of a buzz. Imagine, it's funny. I have a colleague at Harvard. Uh, soon will not be my colleague because I'm coming here, so it's great. Mm -hmm. um, so that. <laughs> So that person was going to, to do a large survey of Muslims. And I said, that's not going to work. And the survey had questions of, are you or is your brother or mother or cousin gay? And how gay? You know, and how gay? And it's like, that's not going to happen. And that's in, in, a, in the context of, of like, so I'm trying to say that you kind of, we need to understand what we can do when it gets to research about these things. And it's, it's, it's a very hard to reach population, first of all, for multiple reasons. I mean, there are people who, who do research on hard to reach populations in the context of the US, studying different underprivileged particular elements within the Latino community, for example. Particular small group of Asians in the context of the United States, for example. So they, they come up with innovative methodological tools by which they reach them. Um, because I know my culture, I know that the mosque is a good place to find both the religious person and the a-religious person. Um, and the person who prays five times a day and the person who's had, um, you know, a, a alcoholic beverage the night before, okay. um, et cetera. So, 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 I would, so there needs to be that engagement in research with Muslims, but there needs to be within the Muslim American community more of an engagement with this. But of course, I mean, we're missing something that we haven't mentioned here. Non-Muslims, okay, multi-faith approaches to dealing with questions over acceptance, over religiosity, needs to take place on a much more active level in America. Okay. I mean, sure, you find this like, oh, let's hold hands and, and you know, walk around the fire. But, but sure, that's wonderful. But I think it needs to be a lot more serious and a lot more rigorous than they do right now. Because okay. it's more kind of like just saying like, oh, this is America. We can all be cool with one another. Sure, we can. We are. Okay. But we need to step beyond that and actually have a serious discussion. And one thing that I like very much, for example, is, is when the Jewish American community in the New York City area, they stood with the Park 51 project. Very much so. Okay. As Palestine aside, all of that stuff aside, when it gets to this, this is a very important critical thing for minorities. Okay. So for the Jewish Americans to do this, with all of absolute respect, because I think that Muslims should do the same thing. If there is a banning of a building of a synagogue somewhere in America. Okay. So that discussion will go forward. Sir? Do you have a this unfortunately this will be the last question. But we can we can, you know, I'm hanging out with you. <laughs> Do you have a list or a graph of uh, different ethnic groups that are Muslim in the United States that are that have a high religiosity or low religiosity or just don't That's don't, a good don't practice the religion but Well, Arabs tend to score uh, lower on religiosity in general. Religiosity and like multiple. I mean, I, there's there are two levels. One, you think you're religious, and two, you actually practice. It. <laughs> 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 no, no, I mean, I, 
I'm, I'm actually coining that term because when people say like religiosity, you go to the how, how often? You know, well, speaking mm -hmm. of people who do crazy surveys, there's a French guy who was asking like, so how 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 Muslim are you? <laughs> so do you drink one glass of wine, two glasses of wine, <laughs> or or do you pour? How much? A little or too much? <laughs> no, it doesn't make sense at all. Um, so, so speaking of, of that religiosity uh, thing, so I think it's, it's, it's two elements. There are people who think they are religious. How, how religious do you think you are? Right? And then two, do you go to the mosque? Do you participate in zakat? Okay? When was the last time you gave sadaqah? You know, those various sorts. And I even put, put in a curveball. Are you ready? I asked a question, which of the following is not a, a month in the Islamic calendar? <laughs> it's, it's a tricky question to know knowledge. If someone says, yes, I know Islam very well. I am 100%, I know Islam, I'm Muslim, I know it. How, 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 how religious do you think you are? I'm 100% religious, I know it from A to Z. And then you ask them, which of the following is not a month in the Islamic calendar? It's one of those tricky questions. You just don't know it. You know? <laughs> Very hard to kind of memorize it, the months, right? Am I am I right? So when someone says Rabia Thalith, which is like not accurate, it's like I'm sure of it. I'm, I know Islam very well. It is this, and then you know that there is a problem. So there's a curveball that I threw in to measure that level of religiosity. So, I mean, only a person who actually reads a lot, reads reads the, the Quran and kind of reads kind of the exegesis is what it's called, the stories of the Quran and kind of interpretations of the Quran, all of that stuff. When, when the person reads a whole lot of that, they kind of know the, the Islamic calendar quite well. Because it's one of those things that's all in the back of your mind. You know that it's true, but it's, you know. So um, Arabs tend to score less than other people. Uh, the most religious people are converts, which is quite interesting. Have you seen that mosque, uh, mosque on the little parrot? <laughs> episode? Anyway, so go Google it. <laughs> Um, uh, there's, there's a show, a Canadian show called Mosque on the Little Prairie. It's awesome. Uh, so it dispels a whole lot of misconceptions and so on. So, um, in terms of religiosity, um, let's see. People from Asia um, are more religious, and women are more religious than men in that context as well. So, but then there is that breakup. I can, I can easily do this. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you.